Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper, beginning with a news item on page number one of the Delhi edition of The Hindu relevant for GS Paper 2. Financial Action Task Force. It is an intergovernmental agency. It was set up in the year 1989. Its principal objective was to curb money laundering. The financial system that we have in the world, the banks, non-banking financial corporations, the financial sector that we have should not be used for or misused for money laundering. That was the objective of FATF when it was set up in the year 1989. Then when 9-11 attacks took place on United States, the scope of FATF was expanded. Now FATF would also look into terror financing which means what is the objective of FATF objective is that the financial system that we have in the world should not be misused for money laundering should not be used for terror financing that is why FATF what it does it creates two lists one is a gray list the other is a black list all those countries for example Iran North Korea which are not cooperating with FATF, which are not cooperating with FATF on money laundering or terror financing, they are placed in blacklist. And all those countries which do cooperate with FATF, but that cooperation is not enough. They have to do a lot more to curb money laundering, to curb terror financing. Those countries are placed in gray list. Pakistan has been placed in gray list twice. Last time, when Pakistan was again put on grey list, Pakistan was given an option that you will have to comply with 27 action plans. Comply with these 27 action plans and then you will be removed from grey list. Otherwise, you will be placed in this very stringent blacklist. When in November last year, a review meeting was done, it was argued that Pakistan has complied only with five of these 27 action plans. So Pakistan was threatened that in February 2020, when we will have another review, if you will not comply with all these 27 action plans, we will be sorry, but we will have to place you in this blacklist. Now what FATF has decided, according to newspaper reports, Pakistan will remain in this grey list. Why? FATF is chaired right now by China. And in FATF, we have two friends of Pakistan as well, Turkey and Malaysia. They all have come together to ensure that Pakistan is retained in grey list. Pakistan is not blacklisted. Although the final decision will be announced only on Friday, but newspaper reports tell us that Pakistan will remain in grey list. Pakistan will not be put under blacklist. Newspaper reports also tell us that Pakistan will be kept in this grey list for a period of three to six months. After that, these two countries have promised that we are going to remove Pakistan from this list of grey list under FATF. This FATF, we have explained in detail on 19th October 2019 as well as 27th January 2020. So we won't explain what this FATF is in detail because this issue we have covered in detail twice in the past as well. But what you need to know, you need to know that Pakistan will remain in FATF's grey list. It has not been placed under the blacklist. Now let's look at another issue on page number two relevant for prelims. Centers response sought on plea by Arjuna Awadi. Why? Because he claimed discrimination. What are these Arjuna awards can be a potential question in your prelims examination. These awards were initiated in the year 1961. It is given to those players who have exhibited good performance that too consistently. When we say consistently, that means for a period of last four years. That means Arjuna awards is a category of awards given to sports persons given to players who have exhibited good performance consistently for a period of four years. That too at an international level. One more important thing, 
this player who is to be awarded arjuna award should also have shown qualities of leadership sportsmanship and sense of discipline as well so these facts you must remember for your prelims examination now let's look at another issue on page number 12 relevant for gs paper 2 kothari is tipped to be central vigilance commissioner julka is going to be chief information commissioner what is the cvc cvc was set up in the year 1964 on the recommendations of a committee on prevention of corruption this committee on prevention of corruption was headed by shri k santhanam so santhanam committee recommendation is responsible for the creation of cvc but this cvc was neither a constitutional body nor a statutory body it was set up based on a government resolution that means a government resolution was passed and cvc was established that means cvc was an extra constitutional non statutory body but in the year 2003 cvc was given a statutory status a cvc law was passed and central vigilance commission was accorded with a statutory status what is the composition of cvc it consists of central vigilance commissioner and not more than two vigilance commissioners but who appoints this central vigilance commissioner central vigilance commissioner is appointed by the president but not on his own on the basis of the recommendation of a committee this committee is headed by prime minister another member of the committee is the minister for home affairs and the other member is leader of opposition in lok sabha or the leader of the single largest party in lok sabha that is why adhir ranjan choudhry who is the leader of the congress party in lok sabha also participated in these meetings but the name which is recommended by this committee to the president normally this name is chosen on the basis of unanimity on the basis of consensus but in this particular case sanjay kothari who is currently the secretary to the president of india is going to be the next chief vigilance commissioner or central vigilance commissioner despite the fact that the congress leader adhir ranjan choudhry has expressed reservations about his appointment but this is not something unique in 2012 when pj thomas was to be appointed as the central vigilance commissioner the then leader of the opposition in lok sabha ms sushma swaraj she was opposed to the appointment of pj thomas as the central vigilance commissioner what about chief information commissioner the office of the chief information commissioner was constituted in the year 2005 this chief information commissioner is also appointed by the president but based on the recommendation of a committee headed by prime minister leader of the opposition in lok sabha or leader of the single largest party in lok sabha another member is the cabinet minister this cabinet minister is nominated by the prime minister this high powered committee recommends cic name to the president and that individual is appointed by the president as the central information commissioner that is what you need to understand from this newspaper article Now let's look at some of the editorials and columns from today's newspaper. First one, visa power. British Labour MP Debbie Abrahams, she is also the chairperson of United Kingdom's all-party parliamentary group on Kashmir, and it is considered that Debbie Abrahams is very close to Pakistani establishment. She is very close to ISI, and she has been very critical of the government of India's decision. of deoperationalizing article 370 of the constitution of india she is also very critical of the alleged human rights violations committed by the indian security forces in kashmir that is why when miss debbie abrahams she landed in delhi she was detained she was questioned and ultimately she was deported her visa was cancelled this newspaper editorial raises a question the question is if her ties with the isi or the pakistani establishment were known to the government of india why was miss debbie abraham provided visa granted visa in october 2019 and why did it take 4 months for the government of india to cancel that visa this is similar to what happened in december 2019 
external affairs minister mr s j shankar he was on a visit to united states there he had to meet a very influential house foreign affairs committee of the united states but at the last moment this meeting was cancelled why because another congresswoman miss pramila jayapal she was also a member of this house foreign affairs committee and miss pramila jayapal she was also critical of the government of india's decisions on jammu and kashmir in fact she had authored a house resolution which called the parliament of united states that you should criticize the government of india's decisions in jammu and kashmir and that is why as a mark of protest the foreign affairs minister s j shankar cancelled his meeting with the house foreign affairs committee but you need to understand that miss debbie abraham is part of the labor political party which is in opposition in united kingdom also miss pramila jayapal she is a democrat and us president donald trump belongs to the republican party the grand old party of the united states so in no way do the actions of the government of india in protesting against miss pramila jayapal or cancelling the visa of miss debbie abrahams in no way are these actions going to impact india's relationship with united kingdom or the united states why because these two members are part of the opposition they are not part of the government but what happens when governments themselves criticize or are critical of government of india's actions in jammu and kashmir for example turkey or malaysia when malaysia criticized the government of india's actions in jammu and kashmir india acted swiftly and imposed restrictions on the import of palm oil and in fact malaysia is one of the largest exporters of palm oil so it affected malaysia's economy what about turkey turkish president mr erdogan was in pakistan and he justified turkey's strong ties with pakistan and turkey has once again reiterated its support to kashmir's independence or resolution of jammu and kashmir based on united nations security council resolution because these resolutions call for a plebiscite in the state of jammu and kashmir so what happens when governments are critical of government of india's actions in that case india issued a strong protest a demarche against turkey government of india expressed anger that a foreign country is meddling into the internal affairs of india this newspaper editorial says this line of the government of india that no other country should interfere in the internal matters of india this line would have been valid if at the same time government of india would not have been organizing groups of foreign envoys to visit jammu and kashmir last year few mps of the european parliament were made to visit jammu and kashmir then we saw the visit of the foreign envoys and high commissioners led by us ambassador who visited jammu and kashmir as well then we saw another visit of european union envoys to jammu and kashmir so on one hand you are allowing these foreign envoys to visit jammu and kashmir on the other hand you are calling the foreign governments that you should stop interfering in our internal affairs these two lines contradict each other the boycott or deportation of politicians visa denials to foreign journalist all appear to be part of a pattern of a whimsical behavior which is not suited to a democracy like india that prides in its traditions of openness and debate that is what is mentioned in this editorial but if you look at the other side it is the right of the government of india to deny visa to a person who is very close to isi or pakistan secret intelligence agency it is the right of the external affairs minister to deny meeting an individual who is biased against india and if the government of india is asking the envoys or high commissioners ambassadors of foreign countries that you should please go and visit jammu and kashmir to see for yourself that there are no restrictions in jammu and kashmir that all the actions that we have taken on jammu and kashmir are for the larger interest of the people of that region it is also part of diplomacy so it should be better left to the government to decide how they want to carry on with their diplomacy if there are countries who genuinely and honestly want to know what exactly is happening in jammu and kashmir the government can facilitate their visit but if there are countries who are hell bent 
on internationalizing Jammu and Kashmir, who are hell-bent on siding with Pakistan, it is the right of the government of India to deal with those countries separately. That is what you need to understand from this editorial. Now let's look at another column in US trade action and Indian counter strategy. US President Donald Trump is on a visit to India. He will be landing in India on February 24. There was a hope that a trade deal may be signed between India and United States. Now in all likelihood that trade deal has been put off. Also, if we look at the statement of Donald Trump today, he says that India has not been treating United States well. But despite the fact that India has not been treating United States well, he loves Indian Prime Minister Mr. Modi. We have also witnessed that in 2019, India was taken off from a list of GSP, Generalized System of Preferences. Under GSP, United States and other developed countries, what they would do, they would import certain products that too from developing countries and these products would be imported on concessional rates. That means United States will give a concession to those products coming from developing countries and on concessional rates those products will be imported to United States. Important thing about GSP was that it was non-reciprocal which means that if United States is importing some goods, some products from India at concessional rates, that does not mean that India also should import some goods from United States at concessional rates because GSP was non-reciprocal in its attitude. But India was taken off from this list of GSP. And last week, what has happened? India was taken off from the list of developing countries. That means India will now be treated as least developed countries by United States, not as developing country. When India is not treated as a developing country, that means the exports from India to United States. If these exports have been subsidized by the government of India, then on these products, countervailing duty will be imposed by the United States. That means the Indian exports to United States are going to become expensive as well. It is in this backdrop that there are serious challenges in India-US relationship. But let's wait for the visit of the US President Donald Trump. Then we will have an elaborate discussion on Indo-US relationship with particular emphasis on trade between the two countries. Now let's look at another editorial birds hit. This is related to State of India's Birds 2020 report. And this report we have discussed in detail in yesterday's The Hindu Newspaper Analysis. But one important thing. The latest report is refreshing as it taps into citizen science for good data and should serve as foundation for further collaborative work. This is a very important statement can be asked in your mains examination. Because what is unique about this report is that we have involved citizens as well. Not just ornithologists or experts, we have also included and involved citizens, ordinary bird watchers. If they would have watched a bird, taken the photograph of this bird, then this information would have been provided to the authorities. That means we are also involving citizens in collecting data. And then this data will be used to ascertain whether the population of a particular bird is stable or it is declining. So more and more citizens should be involved in collecting the data that is going to play a huge role in future collaborative work. That is what you need to understand from this editorial. Now let's look at another column. It's time to empower mayors. Aam Aadmi Party won the elections. Arvind Kejriwal is now the Chief Minister of Delhi, but the Chief Minister of Delhi is often compared to that of a mayor because Delhi is a union territory. The Delhi government does not have the power to take decisions on land, on law and order, on police. The police reports to the Minister of Home Affairs at the union level. So Arvind Kejriwal as the chief minister of Delhi is often viewed as a celebrated mayor of an urban local body. And when Arvind Kejriwal has won the election, this column argues that it is time to empower mayors as well. How can we empower mayors? 
it is time that elections to urban local bodies should take place on non-party lines which basically means two things number one mayors to urban local bodies should be directly elected as of now you vote for your councillors then these councillors choose one amongst them as the mayor of an urban local body normally for a period of one year which is renewable as well what this column argues that we should have a directly elected mayor according to this column there are only two states Uttarakhand and Jharkhand where mayor is directly elected we should expand this throughout the country so that throughout the country urban local body mayors are directly elected by the people second elections should be held on non-party lines that means political parties should not contest urban local body elections this column argues that panchayati raj institutions at the village level their elections can happen on party lines basis that means political parties should contest panchayati raj elections should contest rural local body elections why because if political parties are not contesting then people will start voting in the name of caste that means right now what is happening when people have to vote in rural india they will vote for a political party if political parties are not contesting elections then they will seek details about the castes of those who are contesting elections and they will not cast their vote they will cast their caste so to prevent this caste politics at the rural level we should have elections on party lines in rural india in rural local bodies but caste according to this author is not a factor in urban India that is why in urban local body elections political parties should not contest elections elections should be held on non-party line basis the reason given by the author is that under the current system chief ministers of the states they do not want a strong urban local body mayor why because this mayor would be a threat to the chief minister and since elections is conducted on party line basis which primarily means that councillors will elect one amongst them as the mayor and normally what happens the ruling party will choose a member of its own political party as a mayor who is not a threat to the chief minister so if elections are held on non-party lines ultimately this mayor will emerge as an independent entity a strong well educated well qualified youngsters will be encouraged to take part in the election process that is what you need to understand from this column now let's look at another column written by rajiv bhargava the significance of the term secular let's say for example if there is a liberal democracy now what is a liberal democracy a liberal democracy where individual fundamental rights are guaranteed to the citizens where political freedoms are given to the citizens that means there is non-discrimination in a liberal democracy what is the use of this term secular because secular means non-discrimination on the grounds of religion so if there is a liberal democracy which believes that there should be no discrimination on any ground so then what is the point of having this word secular part of a liberal democracy because then it would mean that this word secular would be subsumed in a liberal democracy secular would be a subset of a liberal democracy to make it even simpler for you what is the value that this word secular adds if we are a liberal democracy as a liberal democracy we provide fundamental rights to the citizens freedom of speech and expression non-discrimination right to equality right to life and personal liberty right to practice your religion as well so if in a liberal democracy we have non-discrimination as a fundamental right then what is the point in using this word secular because secularism would mean no discrimination only on the grounds of religion rajiv bhargava argues that if we talk about western european countries this word secular may not make much sense how did the secular states emerge in european countries there were wars and when these wars were won or lost he would force all the people of that area to opt for the religion of the king 
when you opt for the religion of the king that means this entire area becomes homogeneous but what if there are people who do not comply with this diktat of the king who does not embrace the religion of the king they were either expelled or they were killed that means they faced either expulsion or death that is how european societies they became religiously homogeneous what i'm trying to say how did these secular states emerge in europe initially when there were wars whoever was the victor the king would say that all the subjects all the people should embrace the religion of the king if you are not following that diktat either you are expelled or you are killed that means through this diktat the country or the area became religiously homogeneous but over a period of time when this church or this religious entity became oppressive there were movements that this church should be separated from politics this church should be separated from economy that means so far as political matters are concerned church should not interfere so far as economic matters are concerned church should not interfere this is secularism in europe that means separation of church matters religious matters from those matters which are temporal for example politics for example economy this is secularism in europe but in western european liberal democracies secularism would not mean much why because secularism would say non discrimination on the grounds of religion but when this entire area is religiously homogeneous then secularism does not matter much the word that is much more important is that they are a liberal democracy but rajiv bhargava argues so far as india is concerned multi religious societies are concerned diverse societies are concerned we cannot only rely on liberal democracies we should also have secularism as part of liberal democracy why because secularism would mean equal treatment of all religions secularism would mean non partisan outlook of the state secularism would mean equal recognition of all religions since these countries are not religiously homogeneous that is why apart from liberal democracy tag they should also add the word secularism so that we can add confidence in the impartial character of the state that is what you need to understand from this column Now let's look at some of the practice questions first for prelims and then for mains which of the following gases is or are not the components of the national air quality index sulfur dioxide is ammonia is carbon monoxide is carbon dioxide is not so a four only is the correct option which of the following decorative forms were used in indo saracenic architecture for example chhatrapati shivaji terminal in mumbai is one example of indo saracenic architecture similarly madras high court is one example of indo saracenic architecture so which of the following decorative forms were used colorful tiles yes jalis bell motifs calligraphic inscriptions all of them The term automatic exchange of information often seen in news relates to which of the following it relates to systematic transmission periodic transmission of taxpayer information by the source country to the residents country for example for example under this automatic exchange of information every year switzerland will share the taxpayer information with india as well Which of the following peninsular rivers drain into Bay of Bengal? Bharatapuzha, no, it's in Kerala. It drains in Arabian Sea. Sharavati, it is in Shumoga district of Karnataka. It also drains in the Arabian Sea. Betarani, yes. Palar, yes. So three and four. C is the correct option. Question number five: Nalaban Island, frequently seen in news, is located in Chilika Lake. Practice question for mains. Question number one. the efficient functioning of an institution is not dependent on just an expansion of its role integrity holds the key robust institutions must have adequate provisions for ensuring transparency elaborate this is in response to the discussion we have had on cvc and cic question number 2 urban local bodies can have meaningful empowerment only if the concept of non party elections is adopted comment 
that is it from our newspaper analysis for today thank you for being with us have a great day